our series called Spirit Led, the journey of surrender and obedience is a way of life. Um, here's my goal today, just like Ken did, we didn't even uh, plan this out. My goal this morning is to look at the life of the Holy Spirit in Jesus and his personal mission and how we're called to replicate that. So uh, there's a lot of verses here. I will not be able to get through them all. Our notes will be online. Uh, I've done a lot of study behind this. So normally uh, we'll give more of a traditional message with maybe a story. Uh, this will be a little bit more exegetical, a little bit more of an exegesis of different types of scripture. So again, if you're visiting today, this might be a little heady. I'll start off with the story, end with the story, but have a lot of uh, meat in between. Sound good? We ready? We awake? Sounds good. Luke chapter 3 verse 16 in John chapter 16 verse 7. So you can earmark those in your Bible or on your phone. I trust you're not checking out Facebook or Instagram in Jesus name. So to Luke chapter 3 verse 16 it says this, and John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of the sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John 16 7. Nevertheless, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your ministry that's already taken place. We thank you for the miracles and the testimonies that we're hearing. Lord, we're believing that this is the beginning of greater things. I thank you for the words of my brother Ken as he studied, as he sought you, as he's been a significant leader in this church. This, this book is a word of the Lord for this house. And I pray, rise up your anointed ones, Lord. Those that carry fire, those that are fierce and courageous, that would speak your word with boldness. But I pray this morning, you know all that we've prepared together. Whatever you want to share, let it happen, Lord. Pray for courage and faith, ministry and freedom to take place this morning. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, get ready. Wake up a little bit. I love my children. I love being a parent. But we all know kids make you laugh. They make you cry. They make you gray prematurely. They make you pull your hair out if you have any left. I love my kids, but we all know any parents out there, it is a journey to raise your kids in the modern day. There are things that we face, things that we wrestle against that no other generation of parents have ever had to face before. The technological age we live in and we as parents trying to catch up to that technology is nearly impossible. How many of you had their kids try to educate you in how to use technology? Are you with me? It's a regular occurrence in my house. A couple weeks ago, it was my birthday. Thank you for all those, for the Facebook messages and small gifts. It was a great birthday. Last year before 40, I know, we're getting there. We're getting older. Uh, but it was an amazing, amazing time. Well, my friend Brandon Leon, who's in the front row there, we have a birthday a week, about a week apart. We're 1983 born. Any 80s babies with me this morning? Great decade to be born. Amazing decade to grow up in. Uh, but what we try to do is once a year, we have like a, a guy's trip. It's good to get away as guys, not just in the heathen model of today of guys' trips, but genuine men that seek the Lord together, that love the Lord, and eat great food. Anybody with me? So we, uh, we try to have a trip away together uh, once a year. So we set up this trip, and what I did is I, I set aside a little bit of birthday money, saved up a little bit because we were going to eat well on this weekend. So what I did like a responsible adult is right before we went on the trip, I intended to pay my bills. And so I have a separate account that I pay my utilities out of and have kind of an emergency fund with. If anything breaks in the house, I don't use it often. I check it twice a month when I make a deposit in and then when I pay my utilities. So the day before we're about to leave, I go and check my account. And when I open my account up, I get this notification that says, you have been with overdrawn and have been charged a convenience fee. I say, that's impossible in which I open up to see 55 charges to Xbox, totaling over $1,000. Oh, I lost it, big time. So I kept my cool, asked for the grace of Jesus, and I called Xbox. Hello, sir, please listen to this music as you wait. No, I do not want to listen to this music as I wait. I want to find out how this happened. 
So call them, sorry, sir, for your inconvenience, but you'll have to speak to our fraud department. Well, patch me over to your fraud department. There, we're sorry, sir. We're only open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Central Time. <laughs> Not happy. I said, great. Call fraud department next day. Sorry, sir. We're un un unable to process your fraud claim because it was under your name. I said, I didn't activate any of these charges. None of these charges are authorized by me. Well, then you'll have to take that up with your bank. Oh, I will take it up with my bank. <laughs> Call my bank. They say, hey, we're going to get this covered. Unfortunately, it's a 14-day account. Your account's going to be held for 14 days and suspended. <laughs> there goes the guy's trip. So I called the guys. I'm like, do I have to cancel? You know, I, I don't even have the money to pay for the hotel. They said, hey, we got you covered. We know you're good for it. So I'm going there. And now I'm not just on a budget. I'm on zero and deficit of a budget. I have to pay the utility bills, all these types of things. Well, in an unforeseen, unprecedented way, not for my friends, I receive $1,000 in cash. And I have this $1,000, and I'm like, this is the provision of the Lord. It's not for fun money. It's for bills and utilities. That's all this is, and I'm holding on to it so tight. Well, that night, we're going out to dinner, and Brandon says, hey, I just get this impression from God's Spirit. We're going to meet someone today, and God's going to encounter them in a significant way. I said, okay, we're ready. We're prayed up. We're on mission together. There's nothing better than having friends you're on mission with. So we go out to dinner, and we end up meeting this employee of the hotel. We hit it off, this guy in his young 20s. And as we're there, Brandon gives me the look, and I'm like, oh, this is the guy. So we build relationship, and, and he's working, and, and we, I start to get this impression, this word of knowledge about some ailments he has. And he's working. I just know it's not the right setup. So I'm just like, okay, Lord, what do we do? And then Brandon's like, hey, we leave tomorrow, but after your shift, why don't you come by our hotel room so we can hang out? He says, sure, why not? Now, again, it's only the Lord, because what random guy in his 20s wants to hang out with guys in their late 30s and early 40s on a Sunday morning? <laughs> so sure enough, it's like, that's the Hail Mary. You know, like, if he ever fulfills this. The next morning at 10 a.m., knock on the door. There he is. He's ready. We're, we're all ready, too. We know the setup's happening, right? So he walks in. We start talking, hanging out. Well, of course, as it always happens, he starts opening up about his life. Shares how his mom was a drug addict. Shares how he got reconciled with his father, who he never knew when he was young. But as he met his dad, his dad got cancer and died a few months later. And now in his late 20s, is taking care of his younger brother he didn't even know he had. And as he's there, we, we just start to see God's Spirit move. And you'll notice this. It says in uh, Corinthians that the, the life of the Spirit inside of you is the smell of resurrection and death to others. And so when this fragrance of Jesus is coming out, you'll notice that people will say things to you that they would never tell anybody else. That's an indicator of a God moment. Have you ever had that before? I don't know why I'm telling you this. That's an indicator that God's showing up. So he's there, and I said, I said, so... You know, in the midst of all this pain, how have you dealt with it? He says, you know, one day I went to a mountain and I wanted to kill myself, but I decided to take some mushrooms and I met the light. I've heard that story before. <laughs> I said, my friend had the same experience. He said, yeah, and this light told me to not kill myself. I said, let me tell you who that light was. His name is Jesus. And this is where I can get weird really quick. I said, and he sent us here for you. He said, what? I said, God's spirit, we've been praying for you since the moment we met you. And we knew a moment would happen. I said, as I was praying for you last night and this morning, do you deal with issues in your hip up through the side of your ribs? He says, again, expletives, fill in the blanks. How did you know that, right? I said, hey, God speaks. And he said, he sent us here to pray for healing of your body, and not just your body, but also your heart. And Brandon, like blood in the water with a shark, comes in. He's like, God wants to come. And he wants you to imagine that place and forgive your mom and your uncles. Weeping. I mean, alligator tears are there. He says, I can't receive this. You don't know the darkness I've done. In which my friend Nikki comes over, puts his hand on his shoulder, says, bro, you don't know the darkness that I have done. 
and God's forgiven me, and I'll tell you about my story. And my buddy Jeff comes over and says, and God's here with you, and we're your brothers, and we're to stand by your side. And he's weeping in this hotel with four dudes he's never met, and God shows up in a way that's unexpected. Beautiful. But here's the catch. As we're praying, God says, give him your thousand dollars. See, the illusion of modern preaching is the preacher has no struggle or no war with the Holy Spirit. It's all the time, my friends. And then this is where, this is how you know it's God moment. That's my money. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm there. And, and you just know, you're like, if I don't give this money. I said, hey, I want you to look me in my eyes. He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to give you something that you do not want to receive, but you have to receive it because God told me. I said, what's that? I said, I'm giving you $1,000. He said, no, I won't take your money. I said, yes, you will. I said, but here's the deal. My friends are going to pull whatever cash is in their pocket and give it to you now, and it's going to go towards a bill that you know that needs to be paid, and he is weeping. I mean, this is a God moment. And get his info. He goes downstairs. He's going to meet his brother. I mean, he says, you guys changed my life. You changed my life. Texts us that afternoon. And I love it when someone gets newly saved because there's expletives in the middle and they're praising God. It's the best. I save those messages every time. We've now been in contact for the last two and a half weeks. He's doing his best to seek the Lord. And he calls me a week later and says, you will not believe it. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't count the money till I got home. And when I counted it, it was $1,705. He said, this is why it's significant. A week prior, my neighbors were threatened to be evicted. They had no money. He lost his job. His wife was in the hospital. And I gave them all the money that I had. And it was $1,700. I did not have money to pay my rent. And God gave me $5 extra. <laughs> How cool is that? See, here's the deal. We're in this journey with Jesus, and it's learning to be led by His Spirit. But let me tell you, it ain't easy, friends. He knows what we need. He knows the journey we're on. But Paul so, said so well. He says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14, are children of God. Some translations say sons of God. See, we struggle with this stuff, but here's what we have to understand. Jesus paid for us to have access to the Father that was unprecedented. And when we read modern translations of Scripture, we start to gender-neutralize these different verses. But we miss the significance of the context. Why would Paul say we're all sons of God? Here's the reality. In the first century culture, men and women were markably different. And sons had the position of privilege where women were far removed, especially daughters. So by Paul calling us all sons of God, it says it doesn't matter your gender. You now have the highest place of privilege if you're led by God's Spirit. That's what he's communicating. But we'll say children to make it easier for you. We all have access to God's Spirit, and we're led by God's Spirit. But that word Paul uses is a go, this Greek word which literally means to be arrested. And for us, our journey with Jesus is learning to say, I give up. I'm not going to hold on anymore. I'm going to let go. I'm going to let you lead. And this journey is difficult because guess what? We have soulish and selfish desires. We often think of ourselves before others. We often think of our own needs. And listen, Paul wasn't excluded from this. Romans 7, he says, listen, I do what I don't want to do, and I end up doing what I don't want to do, right? It's this back and forth. I love the way Eugene Peterson writes it in Romans chapter 7, the message. He says this, I need something more, Paul says. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. Anybody resonate with that? These selfish needs sabotage that best interest. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do the good, but I don't really do it. I decide to do bad, but then I do it anyway. 
See, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can overcome these soulish desires. As he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And this is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can even do this. See, here's something that's hard for us to understand is when we look at the Gospels and we worship Jesus as our deity, as our King, as our Savior, He's the one that said, it's better that I go and give you the Holy Spirit. And yet I feel so many of us are praying that Jesus would just be back in our lives. He says, I gave you the Holy Spirit to make you look like me. That's the whole goal. And that's the whole intention. It's hard for us to wrestle with these things. Uh, when you study the theology of the Holy Spirit or the pneumatology, as they call it, scholars would call it, it, it's been woefully convicting for me that we have marginalized the Holy Spirit to the warm, fuzzy feelings we get in church and worship. The Holy Spirit is so much more than that. A.W. Tozer said this. I'm going to abbreviate this quote. This is the longer version on the slide. It says this. We have imitated the world, sought popular favor. This is speaking of the church. Manufactured delights to substitute for the joy of the Lord. Oh, this is powerful. And produced a cheap and synthetic power to substitute for the power of the Holy Ghost. We've manufactured these feelings, these emotions that we call God, but really aren't. Because here's the deal. If it's God, as John said, baptism of fire, that means you got to look different when you come out of it. And for a lot of modern experience, it's no different than going to a rave or a concert where you get the same warm and fuzzy feelings with no transformation. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Francis Chan, in his amazing book, Forgotten God, says this. You do not need the Holy Spirit if you're merely seeking to live a semi-moral life and attend church regularly. <laughs> oh, it's so rough. Isn't that the truth, though? To just go through the motions, you don't need the Holy Spirit. If you're signing up for change and transformation, guess what? The Holy Spirit is the only way. But Paul is very clear. The Holy Spirit isn't this invisible force that is unforeseen. The Holy Spirit is God, he says. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, there's a freedom that God has called us to live that can only be accessed by surrendering to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you read books, and again, <laughs> this last couple of weeks studying, these books are thick. Church, I will spare you from the books I've been reading. But when you study the deity of the Holy Spirit, I mean, there are whole chapters and whole dialogues on this type of things. I've summarized it to five easy points to remember to give you insight to the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the pastor in me. Here we go. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit encourages. The Holy Spirit equips and the Holy Spirit empowers. You need all five of these things intact. He's not a casual acquaintance. He's not one we sing a song about on occasion. He's the Lord, and He's here to set you free and to empower you. And here's the deal. When we talk about it's better that Jesus go, listen, He surrendered the fullness of His power and of His deity. He emptied Himself, it says in Philippians 2. So He had a finite being, even though being an eternal God, right? So He surrendered that. He said, listen, my limited space can't reach everyone unless the Holy Spirit comes. My limited space, until I ascend and accomplish the mission I'm here to do, you won't be able to fulfill it unless the Holy Spirit comes. And here's the beautiful thing. The Holy Spirit's main job, to make you look like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18. For we are being transformed into the same image, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Romans 8, 29, you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son by the spirit. This is the journey of the Holy Spirit. But guess what, church? Transformation is a messy process. Transformation is awkward. And guess what? The church is imperfect and we are fumbly and we don't say the right things at the right times. And people hurt each other. Hurt people hurt people. Are we right, church? But if we're going to be a church, and this is what I love. We talked about this one time, having a sign outside, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> Not allowed here if you got your stuff together. Sorry. Because we as leaders don't. If we're going to be a church 
that fulfills the mission of Jesus that seeks and saves the lost, we're going to have to get comfortable with uncomfortable. You're going to have to get comfortable with lives that look messy and look different and don't look religious. It says the main role of the Holy Spirit is to help encourage us, right? But also transform us. When I was a kid growing up in church, you sing some of the weirdest songs in children's ministry in the 80s and 90s. And one of those songs was Bullfrogs and Butterflies. Go like this, Bullfrogs and Butterflies, they must be born again. That was the song you would sing. And because I was a good Christian in children's ministry, I was on the puppet team. Anybody else part of the puppet team? I was a puppeteer. Believe it or not, I went to competitions. We won awards. I even received a certificate. I was a master puppeteer, friends and family. That's right. Master puppeteer right here. So when this song would come on, we would show the transformation of a butterfly. So we had this, oh, so awkward. We had this caterpillar that we'd stick our hand up through and mouth it with and pull it out and it would be a butterfly, right? See, when you think of the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly, it's a beautiful thing. Here's a picture of a butterfly, right? You think of butterflies dancing in fields and landing on your hand. It's all romantic and beautiful. And then we see this, this caterpillar that's colorful and, and light and delicate, and it moves along and it moves. We read the hungry caterpillar to our kids. It's so endearing. And then it enters this cocoon and it breaks free and it's this beautiful butterfly. Guess what? That's not how it's like as a Christian. Your transformation is on display for everyone to see all the time. It's actually a lot more like a, bu like a bullfrog. Here's a tadpole. Right, cute little tadpole in the water. Here's what it looks like as it transforms. It's ugly and disgusting. It has an odd tail, a fat head, a gross mouth, and it's slimy. That's you, church. And unless, if we allow this transformation to be on display, we'll hide all of our funk in secret places. Unless if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and to share truth and love and allow transformation to happen in a grace-filled way, people will hide that which needs to get changed. And when I was studying the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and John makes this declaration, here's what's unique. I found out the reason why he baptized in the wilderness. Couldn't believe this. The main reason he baptized in the wilderness, because he couldn't baptize where the religious were, because the outlaws, bandits, unclean, couldn't get baptized around those that were clean. So the main reason he's in the wilderness is so that everybody that wasn't alive in the synagogue could reach him, make their life right with God. See, the Lord is calling his church to places no one wants to go. The Lord is calling his church to the outlaw, to the bandit, to the broken. And guess what? They look like they're either in Rio Linda, South Sac, Del Paso Heights, or Granite Bay. They're all broken, folks. And God has a mission he's calling his church to fulfill. As we summarize this briefly and close this out. Matthew 28 is the Great Commission. We get it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. But here's the deal. We've generalized that and sanitized it so much, we forget the mission that Jesus actually lived. To seek and save the lost. And if we are to look like Jesus, be transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus, it goes beyond morality, but also into his mission. So what was the mission of Jesus? It was this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news, declaring freedom to the poor, setting free the oppressed, recovery of sight to the blind, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. This is the gospel we're called to live as well. We summarize the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is beautiful, but guess what? The gospel of the kingdom that the disciples preached wasn't that. It was the freedom that God's kingdom brought everyone around, that those that could hear. So here's three practical takeaways from this verse that could be an exhaustive series, but we'll summarize now. This is it. How do we live out the mission of Jesus? Number one, a spirit-led life 
has fruit. It says we're called to preach good news to the poor. That word there is euangelion, which is where we get gospel. And here's the beautiful news. The good news needs to be good news, not bad news and sad news. See, for a lot of us, this life in Christianity becomes about everything we can't do. But there is a joy and peace that can only be found in Jesus. And let me tell you this. The world needs to see that joy and peace in the church, not just in what they do in the world. And for us, good news looks like a transformative work of living out the gospel that you've been empowered with. See, a euangelion was something that a king would give an ambassador to de declare to a new city that the king now had charge of that territory. So he's entrusted with the authority of the Father that he now gives to us, Matthew 28, that you're called to kingdom. And guess how that's manifested? By the fruit of the Spirit. See, for us, we need to live a life worth imitating that others want a part of and want to eat the fruit of. See, Paul says this, your life is an epistle or a letter read by all men. The world is watching you. And they're watching the fruit of your life. Until you allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate good fruit, you'll continue to produce bad fruit. I mean, you ever read that list, Galatians 5, 22? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, generosity, all those beautiful things. Let me tell you, you know this. I'm impatient. I can be unkind. I can be unloving. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit can we produce that fruit. It's not by your willpower. Secondly, he said he's come to set captives free. A spirit-led life looks like freedom. It has freedom in it. And for us, we're called to set others free, but it's hard unless if you let freedom happen in your own life. And here's the beautiful thing. We are those that bring and carry light. And there's not a fight between light and darkness when light enters the room. For a lot of us, we overcomplicate this and think we need to extend to some great heights to see people set free. It's carrying the freedom of Jesus in your personal life and inviting others into it. Lastly, it's this. To declare the year of the Lord's favor. See, I believe a spirit-led life has favor. Where this has been broken is we talk about prosperity. Prosperity and provision are a part of it. But the year of the Lord's favor is jubilee where you receive the joy of the Holy Spirit and see everyone around you set free by His goodness. That's the favor of the Lord we're called to walk in. That being said, He says to His disciples that they'll be before kings and leaders. But in those moments, the Holy Spirit will give them the words to say. I believe this church, the Rock of Roseville, this global church is moving, but I want to speak to us. I believe in this next year, you're going to see unprecedented audience with those that are leaders and an influence God's going to put you before. And the question will be, will you speak the words the Holy Spirit gives you or be afraid of the outcome? Will you be afraid or will you stand in the year of the Lord's favor? Secondly, I believe that God's going to produce unprecedented financial breakthrough in your businesses. I do. My friends that are prophets, and we've been praying for this, we're noticing a move that there's going to be a shift of kingdom finances over to His church. It's going to happen. Because God's going to do this great economic shift to raise up business leaders to fund the underground church of the future. It's going to happen. But we have to begin to declare the year of the Lord's favor, even though you may not feel like it. Are you with me, church? Last story here, and then we'll pray. I actually can't. I'll have you come up. I want you to pray for us. Many years ago, before I had my first child, I lived in an apartment right behind the Galleria Mall. And as I was there, you know, you've all, if you've ever lived in an apartment before, they try to convince you to rent a garage. And you think, great, I'll rent a garage so I'll have more space for my stuff. But it's really so you have to walk a half mile to the place you live in, right? So you have these carports and these garages, and I'm at this apartment that's way overfilled. And so one day, I'm, I'm late to work. I have to run home and get something to run back. And all that's open is this carport in front of my apartment. So I think, okay, I'm going to be 30 seconds. I'm going to run upstairs and run back. I'm going to park in this carport. I run upstairs, run back, and there's a car that's boxed me in. It's the guy's spot of the carport. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. 
So I look around. I'm late for a meeting. No one to be found. I call management. They said, hey, we can't release which apartment number that is because we don't want any fights to happen. We'll come down. When he walks out out of nowhere, he says, hey, why are you parking in my spot? I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I'm your neighbor. I apologize. He said, hey, I'm sick of you doing this. I'm like, this is honestly my first time. I promise I haven't done this before. He's like, well, I'm just tired of it. I said, can you please move your car? He said, fine. Moves his car, backs out. I'm like, God bless my neighbor. A couple days later, I see him. I said, hey, I'm sorry that about the whole parking lot fiasco. My name is Brandon. I work at a church called The Rock. He's like, oh, I know who you are. I said, how'd you know? He said, I looked you up online. <laughs> it's awesome. Nice to meet you too. Give me your address. I'll stalk you as well. So we, we engage in this awkward relationship now for several weeks. Well, one day I get a knock at the door. I have some friends over. Oh, but I look at the door. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the neighbor. And he looks mad. Like, what did I do now? I opened the door. He said, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, sure. What's up? He said, outside. He said, okay. I'm like, pray, right? He said, can you come in my house? I said, nope. I can talk to you right here. He said, um, so this, is, this shows you how dated this is. He says, so uh, I heard you interpret dreams. I said, how'd you know that? He said, I looked you up in your MySpace. Okay. He said, I've been having these reoccurring nightmares. Can you pray for me? And I interpret these dreams. He said, I've been running from God. I want to give my life back to Jesus. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. I've had a casual relationship with him now for over 12 years. The world is watching your life. Are we living a life of fruit, freedom? the year of the Lord's favor. This is the journey, and as Ken prayed, the rise of his anointed ones. We're believing for God to break through in power in his church. Let's stand together as we pray here and close out. Prayer team, you can come forward. Ken, pray for us. Amen. You know, when the disciples first appeared on the scene after Jesus resurrected, the, they were accused of being so bold. The, you know, the Pharisee says, these people have been with Jesus. They're filled with boldness. And that's what I want to pray for today, that we would all just be so full of the boldness of the Holy Spirit to do some of the things that Brandon talks about. That's amazing. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you today that you were on the throne and you have released your Holy Spirit into all of our lives, Lord, to do miraculous things. God, we submit our lives to you. Help us to be bold in the Spirit, Lord not to be afraid, not to shrink back from what you have called us to do, but to keep putting one foot in front of the other and proclaiming your righteousness and the freedom that you have to offer. We just submit our souls, our spirits to you, Lord, that you would be in complete control of each one of our destinies that you have for us. Help us to be righteous influencers, Lord, wherever we go, Lord. Help us to maintain a testimony that is pure and holy, Lord, that others would look at and, and instead of mocking, they would admire the, the boldness and the spirit that's behind that. And so we just proclaim your, your will right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, you know, we believe that God speaks and he gives specific words. Uh, Brandon had just a couple things he wanted to share real quick. Uh, these are called the words of knowledge. And God reveals certain things that he's healing, those online, and then we'll release. I have such a funny relationship with the Lord. I actually don't have any words of knowledge. <clears throat> That's, no, but I told him I did, so it's fine. <clears throat> My word of knowledge is this. Uh, the Lord tells me to come up here and tell you that I have no words of knowledge. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And he just has this moment with me and he says, I want you to tell them that it's not your words of knowledge that make you look like me. It's your love. So I, I want to encourage you guys that you guys see people with these amazing gifts. And those gifts are inside of you and the Lord will show you how to use them. But it's not the gifts that bring you closer to make you look more like Jesus. 
It's him inside of you. It's your love for other people. For me, it's just my ability to be put in really awkward situations and just let the Lord drive the car. <laughs> That's really what it is. It's my yes. So I just want to encourage you guys. It's not about perfection. It's not about the gifts that you, that you see in other people. It's about your yes. It's about your obedience. And it's about loving the person that's right in front of you. You love each person, one person at a time. You look them in their eyes and you love them. And it starts out with, Jesus, show me how you love this person. Show me what you love about this person. It's as easy as a compliment sometimes, guys. I, I, I just want to encourage you that it's, we have made the, the gifts and we've made uh, Holy Spirit seem like it's impossible to, to do in everyday life. And that's not true. So I just want to encourage you to just love the person in front of you. And the next time you're in front of someone and you just feel the urge, just ask the Lord, how do you love them? What do you love about them? And see what he does. That's a great word of knowledge. Good job. Okay, as we close here, love that. If you need prayer for anything, physical healing in your body or encouragement, or you're going through some journey, we want to pray with you. If you want to talk about giving your life to Jesus, come down to the front. We'd love to pray for you. Thank you again, church. Have an amazing Sunday.